This is EDUC 4703U, Teaching and Learning, Problem-Based Learning. And the title for this particular video clip is Issues and Implications Regarding PBL. The analysis questions for this video clip are as follows. Number one, how does Sokolingam suggest that problem effectiveness can be measured? Number two, how is the approach taken by Sokolingam regarding problem design different from that taken in this course? Number three, how does Barrett's approach compare to that taken in this course? And number four, what are some of the criticisms that have been leveled at PBL? The topic for the final, final video clip for this course will be a quick look at some of the criticisms that have been leveled at PBL and related issues. Sakalingam 2011 has identified appropriate problem design as the single most important feature required for problem-based learning. In a study of the literature which deals with this issue, Sokolingham lists 11 characteristics which can be used to measure problem effectiveness. These characteristics are organized into two categories, feature design element characteristics and function desired outcome characteristics. And these are given on the slide in front of you. So the feature characteristics include problem clarity, problem format, problem di difficulty level, problem familiarity, and problem relevance. And the function characteristics include leads to the intended learning issues, promotes self-directed learning, simulates or stimulates critical reasoning, stimulates elaboration, promotes teamwork, and triggers interest. And this is taken from Sockenlingham. Um, 2011 Designing Problems for Problem-Based Learning and I will give you the URL in the WebCT course up for this uh, video clip as well. It's interesting to note that great pains are made in the literature not just in Sokolingham's uh, article that was quoted earlier to ensure that the problems in PBL are contextualized to a large extent the approach that we have taken in this course is to ensure that the context and situation portrayed in the PBLOs take on these characteristics. As a consequence, problems themselves can be recognized and identified by the user learner according to the experiences and perspectives that they bring to the context and situation. There is no need then to adapt to the specific problems or problem to meet these characteristics as long as the context and situation is richly described and is genuinely authentic. One additional note may be in order at this point. The orientation taken in this course has been one from a socio-constructivist perspective. In other words, the learning is the responsibility of the learner and what is learned, dependent as it is in this orientation on the experiences and cognitive schema constructed by the learner, may be at variance with that from that intended by the designer and or instructor. Much of the literature the article referenced above included come from the perspective that in order to have learning meet the stated curricular objectives, the learning experiences and activities have to be specifically directed to address them. Hence statements such as, and I'm quoting, overall, in designing problems for problem-based uh, learning, function characteristics learning outcomes not just content, but also what behavioral skills, such as self-directed learning, critical thinking, etc., need to be considered and the issues should be framed in the appropriate context and presented using the op optimal feature characteristics user interface, unquote, and that's Sockenlingham 2011. As a result, the design of the two types of PBL described here are very much distinct from each other. Support for alternative ways of thinking about problems comes from Barrett, 2011, who states, and I'm quoting, the nature of effective problems in problem-based learning is that they are ill-structured as opposed to well-structured. The characteristics of PBL ill-structured problems are that they are real-life and authentic, not teacher's exercises, messy, not tidy, incomplete in the sense of lacking information needed for their resolution, and iterative in the way that they produce further ideas, hypotheses, and learning issues. And that's taken from Barrows, uh, 1989, Stephen and Pike, 1977, Margiston, 2001. It is vital in the problems that the problems are engaging, that they smell real, are interesting and challenging to students, 
This engagement stimulates further learning and requires research, elaboration, further analysis, and synthesis together with decisions and action plans. And that, of course, is taken from Barrett 2011, What is Problem-Based Learning? And I will again give the URL in the WebCT portion of this course. More problems with problems. Let's examine the following description of PBL. And I'm quoting again from Barrett 2011. Problem-based learning is problem-based learning, not problem-based teaching. It fits into the learning paradigm, not the teaching paradigm, and is part of a set of student-centered approaches which are discussed in another chapter. A lecturer using a PBL approach is not concerned with what and how they are teaching. Rather, they are, they are observing, looking, listening, stimulating, and provoking student learning. The learning of the students is their focus, not the teaching of the teacher." Unquote. It seems that there is a disagreement regarding the way in which PBL should be structured for learning, particularly when comparing Barrett's comments with Sock and Lingham's in previous slides. Barrett goes on to state that the nature, and this is a quote, the nature of the dialogue in PBL tutorials is a process by which people together create and recreate knowledge as true dialogue unites subjects together in a con cognition of the object that mediates between them. And that's a reference to Ferrer, 1985. Problem-based learning is a, an active process of accessing prior knowledge, making connections between old and new concepts, and using the elaboration of relationships to engage in theory construction. And that's a reference to Schmidt, 2004. The PBL tutorial is the main discursive site for this elaboration. In, the PBL, in PBL, the learners are constructing their own knowledge together. PBL thus has a constructivist view of learning as it suggests that learning results from the learner's action, actions and instruction plays a role only to the extent that enables and fosters constructivist activities. That's a reference to Gisselar's 1966. Continuing on with the quotation, however, it would be a contradiction in terms not to treat the problem-based learning itself as a problem. We all need to continually ask ourselves what is problem-based learning in our context in relation to our students, our disciplines, our culture, our philosophies, and our creativity. Problems and PBL tutorials are essential characteristics of PBL. So what are they like in practice?" Unquote. And that's taken from Barrett, 2011, What is Problem-Based Learning? And again, I will give you the URL in the WebCT portion of this course. Arguments against PBL. Is PBL effective for all learning? While I personally am inclined to rush in and state that this is a ludicrous question, as I believe that life itself is a series of problems that need to be identified and solved in the context of life's social framework. However, it is possible, and some literature reiterates, that some subjects, depending on their structure, may be more easily learned with other methods. For example, in a meta uh, analysis of medical students in PBL curricula and traditional curricula, uh, and reference to Norman and Sh uh, Schmidt in 1993, traditional methods of education produced higher scores on knowledge of basic sciences than problem-based learning methods. And that's a quote taken from Barrett, 2011. So it seems that there are some things that PBL is more effective for and other things that traditional methods are more effective for. Barrett, 2011, notes and another quote, another argument against PBL is that it can be very difficult to change to PBL when some or most of the students and or staff are products of didactic teaching methods. And that's a reference to Walton and Matthews, 1989. Trigger and po Proser in 1996 compared approaches to teaching and conceptions of learning in their 24 teachers of courses in first year chemistry and physics. They found that teachers who had a particular conception of teaching tended to, to adopt a commensurate approach to that teaching. Teachers with a student-centered and learning approach conception of teaching tended to adopt a commensurate approach to teaching. So the argument is that if you want teachers to adopt a student-focused approach to teaching, such as PBL, you would need to ensure that they have commensurate conception of teaching. If this is not already present, a short staff development program will not be sufficient but substantial appropriate staff development is needed to work at this level at the 
this level of attitudes, not just at the level of hints and tips about PBL. Also, an effective teacher induction or student induction program needs to be designed to introduce students to PBL. For any school of a university changing to PBL is a major change management initiative. Such an approach makes demands of the organization of educational institutions and on curriculum planning. Within universities, colleges, and schools, for instance, authority must shift away from disciplines toward interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary groupings of staff. But curricula still need to be designed and students' educational progression monitored. Structures, that is committees, work groups, and the like, are necessary for this. For problem-based learning to be successful, you need some enthusiastic le lecturers, management support, and an effective working group. Sometimes this can, be prove, can prove to be difficult and hard work." Unquote. Seven Batten, 2000, suggests that there are at least five different models which can be used as a basis for the implementation of PBL. Perhaps this diversity goes some way to allow for some equity of access for all learners. And I'll very briefly describe each one of these models. This is quoted from Sabin Baden 2000. Model one, problem-based learning for epistemological competence. Model one is characterized by a view of knowledge that is essentially propositional, with students being expected to become com competent in applying knowledge in the context of solving and possible managing of problems. Model two, problem-based learning for professional action. This model of problem-based learning has, as its overarching concept, the notion of know-how. Action is seen here as the defining principle of the curriculum, whereby learning is both around what it will enable students to be able to do, and around mechanisms that are perceived to enable students to become competent to practice. Model three, problem-based learning for interdisciplinary understanding. In this model, there is a shift away from a demand for mere know-how and propositional knowledge. Instead, problem-based learning becomes a vehicle to bridge the gap between the know-how and the know-that, and between the different forms of disciplinary knowledge in the curriculum. Model four, problem-based learning for transdisciplinary learning. In this model, problem-based learning operates in a way that enables the students to recognize that disciplinary boundaries exist, but that they are also somewhat illusory, that they have been erected. The student might transcend boundaries, but this is not likely to challenge the frameworks into which disciplinary knowledge is placed. And finally, Model 5, Problem-Based Learning for Critical Contestability. This form of problem-based learning is one that seeks to provide for students a kind of higher education which offers, within the curriculum, multiple models of action, knowledge, reasoning and reflection, re reflection, along with opportunities for the students to challenge, evaluate, and interrogate them. Students will therefore examine the underlying structures and belief systems implicit within a discipline or profession itself in order to not only understand the disciplinary area, but also its credence. They will transcend and interrogate disciplinary boundaries through a commitment to explore the subtext of those disciplines. And that again is taken from Sabin Baden, 2007, Challenging PBL Models and Perspectives of Problem-Based Learning um, in De Graaf and Comos, uh, Management of Change in Implementation of Problem-Based and Project-Based Learning in Engineering. For a theoretical perspective, I'd ask you to read the following article, Barrett, 2011, that we've been quoting from, What is Problem-Based Learning? And again, I will give you that URL in WebCT. And finally, the synthesis questions for this video clip are as follows. How does the theoretical basis for Sock and Lingham's approach differ from the one used for this course? Number two, what seems to be the biggest problem with implementing PBL in higher education and why? Number three, thinking about the structure of this course as it has been fashioned upon the PBLO framework, has the structure been helpful for you in order to concentrate on your learning? Why or why not? And number four, which of the five models for PBL proposed by Sabin Baden matches the approach taken in this course and why? Thank you for attending this course. This concludes the video clips for the course itself.